episode of The Claws Corner. Today's guest is an actor, director, producer, writer, editor, and voice actor. He is most well known for his portrayal as Richard Chip Douglas on the hit television series, My Three Sons. Please welcome Stanley Livingston to The Claws Corner. Stanley, how are you? I'm doing great, Richard. How are you doing? I am doing great. Thank you very much, first of all, to Steve Joyner for uh, reaching out to you and saying, I'd love you to be on uh, my show. So thank you, Steve. And thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to be on my show. Because I loved doing my research on you because I would not realized how much you did, all the great people you worked with, what an interesting life you led and still continue to lead. So this is going to be a fun interview. Taking that apart, putting it back together. So I just over time learned how to do everything and I got some kind of weird satisfaction out of being the guy that knew how to do it you know, or when I don't have time I have somebody come out you know and I can see whether they're ripping me off or if they know what they're doing. I want to talk about the actor's journey still because is it do you have to go there in person or now are you starting to release it either online no, we were, DVDs? what happened yeah what happened was when we finished it we released it on dvd it was a uh, eight volume dvd set that was comprised of uh, eight volumes that were 75 minutes each so it was like 10 hours in length and uh, we had it for a while but when i moved i was also doing a project and i i had to pull the website downwards i just couldn't deal with handling that business at, at the time so it's been down now for six years uh, we really haven't sold anything but about two years ago i thought you know what i don't even know if i'm going to come back up on dvd i thought so i transcoded all the video uh, so it can be shown online and it would be streaming media so basically it should be done in about another month uh so yeah you'll when i put the actor's journey website back up you'll go there and you can see all the volumes and then the volumes are comprised of segments so you can either watch the whole thing and purchase that, or you can purchase a volume and see if you know you like it, uh, the one you may be most interested in. And we'll probably have the segments available. Most of the segments are about 10, 15 minutes long. So it'll be fairly inexpensive and you could just do it as your leisure. Uh, you know, actors aren't generally that well healed. So for some people, it would be a good way to do it because you can, you know, spend five bucks at a pop and work your way through it. And uh, so it makes it much more economical. And I probably will still have the option to have it there on DVD. I'm, I'm just the kind of guy when, you know, it's, it's sort of like what happened with computers and software. Remember how when you get your original software, you got a DVD and that's what you put in, but you had it in your hand. <laughs> There's something about having it there when your computer goes down at three in the morning, you go, I need to reinstall this, you know, and without that, you're, you're dead in the water till the next day so you can do a tech call. So to me, when a lot of these companies like Adobe, you know, started making Photoshop, you know, I've got my, my discs, but in the newer version, it's all online, you know, it's in the cloud and you pay a monthly fee to have it. But I, I never really liked that. I like owning the thing, an object. So, but, you know, I think me with a book and a still, Kindle. I was going to say, it's similar to me with a book and a Kindle. I love having a hard copy of the book yeah, in my hand, copy, reading yeah. it. Call me old school, but I just do not like the Kindle. I don't like the Nook. I like, so that I know exactly even, what you're saying. I'm even worse than you. I want the book. <laughs> I want to turn the pages. I like to smell it, you know. It's it just, you know, I'm from old school. So reading things online. I think it's harder on your eyes, too, to read something online. And I was yeah. a literature major. So you can't imagine how many books I had to read in four years, you know, which is insane uh, to get through all those classes. But yeah, uh, so with this program, yeah, it'll be available online in its various iterations, all volumes, segments. Uh, and then I'm, I'm probably still going to have the option there to get the DVDs if somebody wants them. You know, we just manufacture them and send them out and you can have them. So yeah, that'll be the way to do it. So how it works is we'll have that actor's journey website back up and it'll have all the segments listed there, a little description, a little icon. And when you click on it, it'll take you to the hosting website and that's where you pay for it, and stream it from. So, and people can go back and after they bought it, stream it, I guess for a year, I think that's kind of what it is. So, or maybe forever, I don't know. I've got to... Have you had any actors from the past that people would know that said, I learned everything from your course and thank you very much. And now that they're said steady in TV or movies? I haven't been in contact with them because the website's been down. I probably had no way to contact me directly. Uh, but yeah, there's some people that, probably bought the dvds eight years ago and 
Uh, I did have one guy contact me. He said, yeah, I've been working pretty steady, you know, and then Good. yeah, credited to you. And I kind of followed, you know, what you said to do. I mean, it's still, uh, it requires perseverance. It requires thick skin because you're still going to get rejected. And that's the one real topic we talk about is being rejected and, you know, how you have to learn to put that into perspective into a certain little cubby hole that you can shut the door on and know it's there and that you've had those experiences but er you have to realize every actor has those experiences and you know the whole idea of this program and that's why one of the people that have done this 20 30 years they had stories to illustrate what i was trying to tell actors you know it's like you know, you have a new actor who got rejected four or five times, they're ready to quit. And it's like, you just haven't done it long enough. I said, you, you, you could get rejected a hundred times. And it's on that hundred and first one when you walk in that you got the job. Not that you did anything bad. You may not have been right for it. Or there's actors that just don't get work, not because they did anything wrong, but the, it wasn't the right part for them. And then all of a sudden this part you get and, you know, you're wonderful in it and it makes your career like, it's like uh what was his name um ah the guy that played the fonts henry winkler oh yeah you know yeah you get that kind of part who knew who knew you know he just was a regular actor before that and you do this one thing and you know it's like wow i you know i can't believe all this came out of that kind of situation but you know what we illustrate in the actor's journey too is when you're being rejected so is everybody else i mean well, it's I, not I just actors radio. Directors no. are being rejected. Producers are being rejected. Scripts that writers wrote are being rejected. So when you're being rejected, or even big movie stars, oh, you know, it's just not publicized that some big part, it could have been, you know, Tom Cruise was up for it, and Mel Gibson, and Harrison Ford. And one of them got it. When the other guy may have wanted it more than the guy who got it. But, you know, at that level, it's just not public. That you're being rejected but so what i always tell actors look when you're being rejected you're being rejected with the best of them <laughs> so yeah. you know you can't well, take it personal i was in radio for a while and one of my teachers instructors taught me or taught the class the more no's get you closer to a yes is he just like you don't get the surge you're gonna be here no 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 maybe on the 12th one yes and so and yes. then that's what happened to me i didn't i mean i don't know how many times i got rejected in radio when i was doing it and they're like, oh, you're too green. I said, I don't, how do I get um, any, how do I get better if I don't, if you're saying I can't get a job because I don't have any experience. How do I get experience if nobody will give me a chance? I got that one job after like the 12th or 13th one. And then I got three more jobs within the next six months to a year. So it's just, yeah, I just was well, very well, here's, persistent. Here's, like yeah, persistent. But here's an interesting thing to wrap your head around. Um, yeah, you, you know, you go on the auditions and you're trying to get the jobs, but you know, there's also, the aspect of learning how to audition because guess what you can't get to a job unless you're good at auditioning it's yes. more important than the acting role and you know what you need to do after you you know audition and didn't get the part that you can't just say okay well better luck next time you got to really use your brain power and think about what you did and is there a way afterwards that you think you could fine tune what you did and learn something from it and that, that's when you finally start getting better and better. And then the other thing is, you know, the auditions are very intimidating, especially in the beginning. But for a lot of actors, they're, you know, I know actors that are pretty big movie stars and they have to go in an audition. They get violently ill before because <laughs> it's like, I, I have, no, I've done this for like, you know, 20 years, but I get literally physically sick when I have to go in an audition. I'm scared. And, what example you know, it's for that because is they Henry never, Fonda. Yeah. Okay. Henry yeah. Fonda, they it, said, he used to throw up before yeah. every yeah. audition, and even when he was a major star. Yeah, I, I have a few friends, and mainly females, but there's guys, too, that would get physically sick before because they were so afraid. And you go, well, why would you be afraid? You've already done, like, 10 movies, and, you know, you're making big money, and you're a star, but it's just this intimidating thing, and, you know, the fact that it exists is, you know, I think it's it's a thing that producers like to do to actors. So you almost have to look at it as like a game. They're just doing this because they can. And it's a way of, I don't want to say intimidating you, but putting you in your place. You know, it's, you, who would audition Marlon Brando for The Godfather, for Christ's sakes? But they did. You know, it's just to say, you're not as hot as you think you are. We're going to make you come in and audition and see what you can do. 
I mean, here's a guy that's like, you know, won an Oscar, has done like what, five or six of the greatest films of all time before he got there. If anybody shouldn't have to audition, it should be Marlon Brando. But, uh, you know, the the powers that be, man, want to let you know we're the powers. We're going to ask you an audition. If you don't want to audition, we're not going to give you the part. So, you know, that's what I say. You just got to keep it in mind when you're auditioning. You're no Marlon Brando, and they made him audition. So yeah, yeah. that's the way I like to put it. In fact, I had some you know, child actor friends afterwards, and, and that's kind of what I told them because they said, "Look, I, I was on this TV show for five years, and it's some crappy TV show. Now they they want me to audition. I'm, you know, I've proven myself." I said, "Look, Marlon, no Brent, Marlon Brando audition for The Godfather. You're no Marlon Brando, so." Learn how to audition and give them what they want. Go in and prove yourself over and over. That's what it is. That's what you're exactly. doing. I mean, they already know. That, I mean, in their head, that they know they're good. They have the confidence. Just show them how good you are and prove yeah, to them. Yeah, or show them something they didn't didn't know you had. You know, or that's up to you to go in and go. Don't be like the character you were in the in whatever the Brady Bunch or <laughs> you know Nanny and the Professor. Go in and be this other guy, and you know, surprise the hell out of them. Back. Surprise the hell out of yourself. That's even more important. You know, that, that's, what, that's what I'm saying. That's what this program is all about. Is It's really almost like a lesson in psychology about how you go about doing this without damaging yourself too much. Or if you get damaged, how to get yourself through it. Because uh, there is that aspect. And, you know, actors end up, you know, actors too. They come to the world of acting for all the wrong reasons, most of them. Uh, they're damaged souls. They either had, you know, bad parents, bad upbringing, bad things happen to them. And they're coming because they see actors and everybody loves these people, or at least that's what they think. That's all BS too. But they come there and want to be accepted and love. It's like, you're coming to show business. This is not a place to come to for love. You are going to get your ass kicked. And these people may love you, but it's going to be for a second only because you're useful to them. You know, and then you, you won't believe how quickly you will be shown the door after the day is done and you did your great scene and it's over. It's like, thank you. Goodbye. Don't call us. We'll call you. And, you know, so if you're looking for love, don't come here. Go somewhere else. Go to an est meeting or something. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to talk yeah. about let's, I want to get back to my three sons for a minute, because we talked that you, you mentioned that you were the first kid to be cast from what I read. And you can confirm this. Um, Fred McMurray had to approve every child actor. That's what I, I read. I, I, it's possible. I, I don't know whether, I don't think he was involved in the casting decision okay. with me. It was a producer. Fact, you know, to be honest, you know, My Three Sons wasn't My Three Sons. <laughs> it was being created. It was actually a show being created called My Three Daughters. Okay. And uh, they were going to have, uh, was it the Lennon sisters, you know, and Lawrence Welk. It was actually created with them in mind. And Eddie Albert is the dad. And Eddie Albert wanted to do it. It turned out it was the Lennon sisters that didn't want to leave Lawrence Welk, who uh, coincidentally, Don Federson, our producer, produced that show. And he made a miscalculation because they, they were very loyal to him. So he revamped it. How I think my three sense came about was he, he must have gone to the theater. I thought about this long after and I had that impression without ever hearing anything about this but there was a movie called The Shaggy Dog yeah. with, with Fred McMurray uh, it was about 58, 59 somewhere in there and you know it was this guy that was a dad and had three sons and one of whom turned into a sheep dog uh, and it, the tone and the demeanor of that show is my three sons I mean the only thing missing was like Uncle Charlie or Bub you know, because I think there was a wife there, so they replaced that. And it sort of became an all-male household, which was unusual. All the TV shows were basically a nuclear family back then. Dad, mom, kids, uh, but mixed boys and girls, where this is going to be an all-male ho you know, household you know, with a grandfather, a dad, three, you know, an older son, a middle-aged teen, and then me, uh, adolescent, and then tramp, <laughs> boy, dog. And that's how that came about. So, um, yeah, I think it was the Shaggy Dog that put that on the back. I, I, yeah, I, I don't think Fred really, at that okay. point, had come along. And they probably went, here, you know, take a look at this film reel. You'll, you'll see this kid can handle the job. You know, and Skippy, it, 
literally my name was above the title i've never had that since so i've been on, been on a downhill trend since 1958 uh, but uh it, i finally got to see it i never saw it till two years ago it, it didn't exist and i met jackie met with jackie you know i knew him my whole life and he was a great guy and like a mentor and yeah, a yeah. friend and all that and i remember i came out i was about 30 or something i said hey yeah do you have a copy of that i said i don't know whether you know this i never saw it because when it was screened it was after med midnight in a theater and i, I you know i was in bed my parents never took me to any of this i never saw this and so i came over to his house i think once or twice we went to garage once and attic once couldn't find it and so the real went missing about three years ago i was on facebook and i saw this guy had facebook posted me or whatever you call it and i recognized the name guy named jay potter and i thought gee you know what that's the same jay potter that was in skippy because he would have been the guy that played my best friend suki in it and so I wrote him a post back. I said, hey, if you're the Jay Potter that was in Skippy, do me a favor, go to my uh, website. There's a contact form there, so it's private. And just send me your phone number. I want to call you. So sure enough, a couple of days later, he, he did. And I called him up. And so we were talking. I said, hey, did, did you ever see Skippy? He goes, oh, yeah, I've seen him, you know, dozens of times. I go, well, how did you see it? I was in it, and I never, it's 60 years later. I've never seen this. He goes, well, I have a copy of it. And I'm like, you do? I go, well, wow, how did you get a copy? I went to Jackie's house, you know, a few times. We couldn't find it. So he goes, yeah, well, I've, I've got a copy on DVD. And I said, wow. I said, so where do you live? He goes, well, I'm up by San Francisco. And I said, oh, wow, well, I'm down in Southern California. I, he says, well, I come down. I go to Palm Springs every year. I have a condo. And I said, wow, maybe we, you could come by my place on the way. I said, and just you know, let me pop it in the, the machine. I, I just want to see what I did or whatever. Anyway, that happened and came here. We went to lunch, came back, popped the DVD in. I got finally got to see Skippy uh, wow. 50 some years later and uh, or six years later. And uh, yeah, you know, and after I saw it, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, well, now I know I was get why I was getting all that work. I mean, I was literally... <sighs> on screen, I would say 90% of the show and had the other half of the lines. And sometimes the, nobody else was there and I had lines. So, you know, I had the burden of that show on my shoulders. I could also see looking at it as a producer, why it wouldn't have really made a good show, you know, kind of unlike Dennis the Menace. Dennis the Menace had a really great character foil, Mr. Wilson, and there wasn't that at Skippy. And I go, where would you go with this? And um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of weird, but I finally saw what I did and you know understood how I got parts. Because one of the other things that happened to me back then, this was right after Skippy and just before My Three Sons, um, somebody had been shown the reel. I think it was at the director and producers. They were in 1960. They made a film version of Huckleberry Finn, and I was on the short list. And I think they wanted me to do it, even though I was a little bit young, younger than I would have thought they would have wanted. And it was my agent that advised me not to do the movie. Of course, that was pretty self-serving of her, not to do the movie because it's just a movie and it'll play and then be gone. <laughs> the theaters and you know, that's where you're going to be in a series and that could go a year or two and I'll collect all the uh, you know, commissions off of it. You know, who knew it was going to go 12 years? So she did make a good choice. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that that particular piece of film, you know, really uh, opened open all kinds of doors and offers and things like that so was it always easy for you to memorize lines as a child because you just mentioned that you were 90 percent of the scenes you had 90 percent of the lines was that yeah. easy for you it was very easy i don't know why well maybe it's hereditary my dad really had a great memory and i think i got his memory i'm not so sure i have it anymore because i had done acting in a while and i just did a short uh about Three, four months ago, some guys I knew called me and said, hey, you know, we were thinking of you for this part. And I go, well, you guys know I don't really act. And he goes, oh, well, you know, when we met you, you were acting. I, I did this film that I produced called uh, In the Picture. It was a Cinerama film. And I said, oh, yeah, yeah, I guess I forgot I did that. So he said, well, could we send you the script and you can look at it? And we think we can shoot it in one night. And I went, all right, yes. And so I looked at it and I was like, yeah, you know, just come and think about it. It'd be fun. I haven't been in front of a camera. And I thought I could do something really weird because he's disheveled a geezer and he's 
really kind of, you know, obnoxious and aggressive. So, and then I, in fact, I still have the beard. I grew the beard for that. Uh, and it was called, it, it's kind of these, I guess they're licensed or somehow have the approval of the people that did Star Wars because it's, it's called Antiquities of Star Wars Galactic something, uh, Galactic Thriller or something. Anyway, I was in, it's the last, they had volume one, two, three, four, five. So this is volume five called The Drifter. And yours truly was The Drifter. So uh, anyway, I, I, I said yes, and then I hung up, and then I said to my wife, I go, God, I hope I haven't made a mistake, because I got to learn like eight pages of dialogue. I don't know if I can memorize anything anymore. <laughs> I got eight pages. I'm like, oh, my God. I, anyway, it kind of freaked me out. Then I thought, well, you know, you did this story your whole life. And it's not like you're shooting it tomorrow. I had about a month before they were going to do it. So I just brought myself up to speed and... You know, by the night we shot it, that was good to go. And, you know, I, I don't think I ever blew a line. So that was good. And had a lot of fun doing it. In fact, I got laser blasted at the end with a laser beam and got killed. So that was fun. And uh, it's up on YouTube. If you want to watch it, it's called I do. Antiquities, I'm check that out today. Star Wars Intergalactic Story. Uh, oh. Yeah, the guys that did it, they did four other ones. So, it, you know, plays off the Star Wars theme, but it's other characters or the, i don't know how it relates to the real star wars but it was just fun yeah, no, sounds like i'm definitely gonna check that out today so with my three sons you mentioned that once they everybody was cast eddie albert didn't want to do it they changed the no. premise of the show question for you is because at the time fred mcmurray and at, this is a time when you were either a movie actor or a tv actor and fred mcmurray was at the top of his game at that time and he finally decided to say, all right, I'll do the show, but under one condition. And it, actually, they made it the McMurray method. Let's talk about that. Okay, yeah. Um, well, you know, Fred had done zillions of movies by then. And I mean, was still, literally, as you said, at the top of his game, was the highest paid actor in Hollywood. And had just come off doing The Apartment, Kane Mutiny, Shaggy Dog, Absent Minded Professor. So it's not like he was lacking for work. But uh, in his private life, he and June Haver, uh, who were married, adopted twins. And, uh, you know, they were probably about seven, eight years old. Then. And he didn't want to go off and, you know, go shooting on location for three months, six months at a time and come back and your family's all grown up. So I think it was just serendipity that uh, he was looking for maybe another way to do acting where he could do it and then come home at night like a regular job. And Don Federson, the producer, after the Eddie Albert McGuire sisters thing fell apart, he probably saw Shaggy Dog and go, God, Fred McMurray, oh, I'm going to contact Fred McMurray. And it just happened that he didn't want to go anywhere, wanted to be in town, was amenable to doing a uh, TV series. So they pitched him and Fred, you know, had a few caveats. One was he didn't want to work into the night. So he said, I'm coming at eight and I need to be, I need to leave at five o'clock or six o'clock. So they agreed to that. And then the other big thing was that he wanted to have a summer saw. So that meant, you know, we would shoot for three months with Fred and then he would leave for the summer months, be gone three months, and then come back at the end for another couple months and we'd shoot the rest of the scenes out or scenes that he was in that we hadn't shot. And that became known as the McMurray method. Uh, and a lot of times we'd shoot scenes that he'd walk out of but the scene would continue, but we would stop there. Somebody come in, take a Polaroid picture of how we were dressed, where we were standing, our hair styles or whatever was going on. And then they would save that. And then maybe two months, three months later, after Fred was gone, we'd come back to that scene, kind of get into position, walk through it, and then pick up the scene from where he you know, shut the front door and walked out of it, finished the scene. Or sometimes we'd shoot a scene that he would walk into and we'd shoot it up to that point. And then, you know, all you had to do was just change angles slightly and, you know, you'd see Fred come in and we'd pick that up six months later and he'd walk in the door and we'd pick up the scene that we shot three months before that. So, yeah, that that's kind of what was the Fred McMurray method. It must have been tough, though, because especially at your age and the other uh, child actors' no. ages, cont well, continuity meaning that, like, you had growth spurts. Um, there must have been other things where, like, at that age, you're growing a little bit quicker, you know, yeah. than as an adult. So, just like I mean, an example would be, I heard about Dodie, the one who played Dorothy the, in the later seasons. In mm -hmm. one scene, she didn't have teeth, and she did. It's just that. So, how did they get around that? 
they had fake teeth made for. <laughs> yeah, 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 because they didn't want any teeth missing on TV. Yeah. And in my own particular case, yeah, you're right. There was, I think it was the year I was between 13 and 14. I went from like 5'1 to 5'6, you know, <laughs> during that nine month period, I grew like a weed. And they had to buy different pants and they were freaking out. And finally, they had to shoot me in the same pants, but my, you know, pants were up to my ankles, above my ankles, and they couldn't shoot any wide shot. And then the other thing that happened too between this, I think it was the second and third year. First two years, my hair was blonde. Third year, it started to go dark and they sent me to Max Factors. And I had, every Saturday, I had to have my hair peroxided or whatever they called it to keep it light color. And it hurt so bad, it burned. And I remember when the fourth year came around, I, I told my parents, I said, I'm not doing that. I have to do that. I quit. I won't do it. And so they had to call the producers and say, you won't do it. And then the producers had to call Fred McClure and go, no, you shouldn't have to do that. It's getting older, whatever. So they went with it. But there was no way I was getting hydrogen peroxide on my head every week and almost crying. It just burned so bad. It's like they put this stuff on you and, Let's set his head on fire. See how that works. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> what that could was, possibly go wrong? Yeah, what could possibly well, what could go wrong? I could have been bald by them. I'm surprised <laughs> I'm not. You know, like man, that that had to change my chromosomes because I used to have really nice, soft Robert Redford hair, and you know, after that it was kind of I thought more wavy and coarse. So it's like it gave me different hair. I think it changed my hair cell structure or something. After a year of that, you know, just well, like you I mentioned said. that. Just I've been going through, and um, I guess Me TV has all the episodes or most of the episodes. I've been watching a lot of them, getting ready for this interview. And one of the episodes I saw recently was where Fred was gone for a while. He came back, and then you were you had the hippie look, and everybody was like, "Oh my God, you have to get a haircut!" And the whole thing had to do about your hair. I wonder if did they maybe make that episode just because of yeah because uh, of the time you know people yeah, yeah. growing hair and I kept pushing to have my hair a little bit longer every year yeah, yeah it was getting a little bit longer but for that show they wanted it to be you know they wanted to make a statement so they had a wig but the wig was terrible it wasn't like how guys would wear their hair it looked like I got I don't know uh, the mother from the Brady Bunch's old wig or something. Florence <laughs> Henderson. <laughs> like, what is this? I remember Jay North was in that show, and he he had some ratty looking thing, probably was Liberace's old wig or something. But we were, yeah, you know, it looked terrible. I thought, I go, nobody would wear their hair like that. And then as the years went by, as you can see, the last three years, it was long, longer, and then really long the last season. Plus, my hair by then was almost black. You know, I, I didn't even have brown hair anymore. So that yeah, really, really changed over time. Now, in the beginning, you, you were filming at Desi Lou Studios. Why did that change? Um, well, we shot there for five years and ABC decided they didn't want to pick up the show anymore. And, uh, you know, most of the time that would have been the end of everything and it would have ended. But, you know, uh, CBS jumped right in and they bought the show from from uh, ABC and but one of the caveats was we had to move to their lot to shoot it so we left the Desilu lot went to CBS in the valley which is called CBS Cinema Center uh, and it was more of a movie studio although they they did shoot some you know TV series there which we were one of them in family affair moved over there uh, so yeah you know we left the old RKO Studios Desilu lot which was Kind of a big blow. I, I always liked working there. And it was right next to Paramount, too. And I used to go over and meet my friends at Paramount. One of them was Dan Walker. I used to go over and eat lunch with him a lot in the commissary. I was just a little kid, but he was, he was really cool to me. You know? Now, was it from ABC, then CBS is when you started filming in color? Yeah, we went to color. Yeah, back, I think the last year we were even on ABC at one color. Or maybe we shot one year of CBS and then they made us move. But I remember we were still Desi Lou and we came back when you're, oh, wow, the sets aren't gray anymore. They're blue and green, crappy colors of blue and green, like green, gray, blue, gray. Yeah, it was all, all different. They said, well, it's because of the color. You know, welcome to it. I go, wow, you know, those are colors. <laughs> What I heard, I thought it was cheaper to film in color. I thought it was more expensive to do black. Well, by and white. then it was, yeah, black and white. You know, because color had become so prevalent that the labs had changed their whole structure, and you know, it was hard to have both. 
So suddenly it was more expensive to do black and white film. It actually got really expensive to shoot anything because they just didn't have the place or room to do it. Uh, so yeah, you'd have to find a specialty lab if you had shot in, in a black and white film stock. So yeah, color was better, you know, and it, it probably added life to the show. And, you know, the people that were watching TV didn't, you know, they bought color TV sets. They didn't want to watch black and white. But, you know, later when Nick, Nick and Knight came along, people did again, you know, it was like kind of a real trip to watch old black and white shows. Yeah. And they kind of evoked a time and place and, you know, cinema history, or you could relive your childhood, which was in black and white, you know. In fact, I didn't even know World War II was in color. <laughs> <laughs> I see that, I go, wasn't it black and white, you know, out, out there, but yeah, you know, you, it, it's funny how, psychologically you think of well i did because i grew up with you know black and white war films and black and white tv and, yeah. you know yeah. when i find, when they finally had i think it was on the history channel you know world war ii in color you went oh wow you know it's a nice sunny day and here i thought it was you know dark and gray and bleak for five and the five years of world war ii was there that's a nice sunny day to get killed on i love it now you mentioned a little bit in the first couple seasons, you had Bob, then it went to Uncle Charlie. So I want to know your experiences working with the great William Frawley. You must have so, so many great stories. Yeah, no, he was a great guy. He was a who, you know, kind of like an uncontrollable actor. And, you know, he was well known and famous now from uh, I Love Lucy. So, yeah. and I was a big fan of that. So it was really fun when I found out he was going to be the grandfather. I was, uh, it was just the nicest guy and I'm, i think he could have been one of those guys like wc fields who didn't like you know kids and animals but he warmed up to me and i never knew either of my real grandfathers so i set out on a mission to make him my grandfather a surrogate grandfather he obliged me and you know we were fast friends on the set and he'd take me to ball games and you know, just sweet sweet guy but you know the, my favorite part of him was his crusty behavior and yelling out profanity and yeah. cursing people out and stuff i thought it was so cool and smoking a cigar or two in his dressing room you know knowing we we're not supposed to be doing this but we did we ate lunch together every day at nicodell's restaurant so uh that was kind of fun and you know he had a little coterie of friends that would you know come stop by the table and have a drink and hang out with us and and then my job sort of became to get him back to the sound stage by one o'clock the producers came to me and said you won't listen to anybody else you have to do this at quarter of one you have to get him up and get him moving back towards the stage so if i said it he would say yeah yeah okay let's go you know but okay. somebody else said it he'd say f you get out of my face <laughs> I know I hear all the stories. I mean, I've read several books on the Lucy, uh, the Lucy years. So yeah, I know that they had a lot of trouble with him doing that too. So what eventually, why did he leave the show? Was it due to health issues? You know, yeah, it was health issues. He was having heart problems. And uh, basically, again, it came down to insurance and because we were shooting with a very extreme version of shooting out of order, meaning shooting in lots of different scripts. If he had died three months into it, probably... 10 scripts, we'd have to start all over again. Wouldn't it be like, you know, if you shot all the way through it, even if it wasn't in order, at least you'd finish a particular show. But they were worried uh, for insurance purposes. Uh, the insurance company said, we can't do that. You know, if he's in too many episodes, you might have to shoot a whole year over again if he dies near the end. So, yeah, they decided to, you know, cut him loose and they did. And about three months later, you know, he had a heart attack. And, Job dead. I heard on the Hollywood Boulevard near Musso Frank. I saw an interview with your brother on um, was was on one of those TV shows. I think the archives, and uh, that he was talking about the difference between William Demarest and William Frawley. He said he loved William Demarest. He said he was like like basically what you just said. He said, um, "No, William Frawley." Then William Demarest was more like a grouchier. Like if if William if he was like a sober William Frawley, I think that's what he was saying. It just uh, there was a little bit. Of a yeah, trip. yeah. But I think in his case, it you know that was more the character he was playing. You know, ah, see, wow, these kids. You know that. Yeah, yeah. Kind of, in real life, Bill wasn't like that at all. You know, he he was just you know just an actor and a really good one, and probably one of the quintessential second bananas in feature films for years. And had done a lot of films with Fred McMurray, so they knew each other. Bill was what he was like 24 hours a day, 
you know. Well, that was him. And, that, they, I mean, he was. Oh even, yeah, I mean, a lot of times we'd have to, you know, cut because you know he'd go off on some tirade, use you know some four letter language, and <laughs> they go, "Cut, Bill, you can't say that. You know, we can't use it. We can't to cut that out." Oh, I'm sorry, I got really ir- irritated that this knife didn't cut the turkey. And they go, "Okay, <laughs> we'll just get you another knife." He goes, "And don't keep stabbing the turkey with it." <laughs> he just funny. go crazy, which was. You know, to the delight of me and probably the crew, you know, we're all cracking up that it yeah. would ruin the shot, but it was worth it, you know, and to get him settled back down and try and, you know, Bill Demers would have never done that. It, it, you know, like I said, that was more of a, uh, a character he played where Bill, De- and Bill probably was pretty much playing himself, but without the, without the profanity. Yeah. No. You know what? I think that's soon as they said the- cut, though. As soon as they said cut, the profanity would start. Uh, really. <laughs> well, you know what? Um, I, I was, you know, like I said, I've been going through. So I, I used to watch it all the time as a child, and I'm going back. I, I think this is one of the only shows for me that actually got better as it went on. For me, like you know, a lot of shows they, you know, they use the phrase from Happy Days, "Jump the Shark." I actually liked the years when Robbie met T. Um, uh, was it Katie, and then. Fred was married to uh, Beverly Garland and they brought in Dodie. A lot of times when they bring in new characters, like, ah, that's tired. It's all like, the example would be Family Ties. When they brought in Andy, I'm like, eh, it's not the same anymore. But fit, for me, My Three Sons actually improved. I I, I still oh, love the yeah. show. It was funny. I love the characters. I love the newer characters. I love Katie. And the, the, I forgot what, I mean, I know Dodie. I can't remember what the wife's name was in the show. Barbara. But I know Barbara. Yes, Barbara. So for, for you, though, was it kind of tough? Because I know that's when they had you get married to Polly and you had your own apartment. So you weren't in the show as much. But you still, I mean, I still see yeah, a lot of scenes. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, I think they were trying to be uh, some equanimity there. So everybody got, you know, scenes in each each script, although we'll probably get cut down. And then, you know, the way, they, even in the beginning, they handled that. The way there's certain scripts that kind of more featured you or Robbie or, you know, Tim Constantine and some featured Fred, some featured Bub, and, you know, they were just kind of continuing on, but, you know, as opposed to having five characters, we had like about 20, I felt like at the end, you know, it was like triplets and Katie and Barbara and Dodie and Polly and Polly's dad, you know, it was just, it was, it was getting out there, but uh, yeah, it's funny that you say that because a lot of people felt the show jumped the shark when uh, Dodie came along. It was just like a, a bridge too far for them. <laughs> yeah, no, that I mean, mean, I, I, I was like, it. so obnoxious, you know. Uh, yeah, that was kind of the way the characters written. And Don Lynn was, you know, she's a cute little girl, but, you know, she was obnoxious. Probably why they hired her, you know. They didn't want some kid that wasn't going to open its mouth. So, but she was fun. In fact, I just had lunch with her, like, uh, last week. Really? So, what's, what's she doing now? She's still acting? Uh, no, no, I think she's, you know, kind of got out of acting. I think I forgot where she said she works. I think she has some kind of secretarial job or whatever. And, yeah, and I guess I do- fairly good life. But yeah, but I never knew she was Leif Garrett's sister. Yeah, yeah, that's part of her job description. Even still is managing Leif. He's a force to be reckoned with and a handful, apparently. And, and her mom, I think she said, you know, he's elderly. So we all have to help our parents out and she's tasked with those jobs i've already done that that deal i'm the guy that's gonna have to be handled soon myself now. It's like, you know, it's like, it's like I, I hope i'm not too much trouble i think it'll be a, a smooth transition for your family i hope but, yeah well i was when i was doing my research i didn't even realize i saw the name all the time and it just didn't even click one of the longest shows longest and most consistent director was Fred D. 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 Dorkova, who then later on went to do the Tonight Show with uh, Johnny Carson. So he was, yeah, they said 108 the episodes he uh, mm-hmm. directed. Yeah, he was there the longest period of time. Uh, Gene Reynolds was also another force to be reckoned with who uh, was on our show and had directed other shows prior to that. And after that, uh, you know, was one of the producers of Nash, and Hugh Grant, and directed a lot of the episodes. And, was a lifelong a mentor people. for me. Yeah, yeah, very talented. And Fred, you know, we all knew was a legend uh, in the industry, you know, even when he was doing My Three Sons, that everybody knew who Fred DeCorvo was. And then, 
you know, he, he'd have the most awesome friends come down to the set who are his buddies, you know, like the president of the United States, Governor Reagan, Willie wow. Shoemaker, you know, the, the creme de la creme of, of Hollywood high society. Uh, and, you know, he enjoyed that role. And, you know, Fred was just this unique character who he was kind of somebody that I really idolized. He treated everybody the same. Didn't matter whether you're the guy doing the coffee and donuts or Fred McMurray. He talked to everybody the same way. What, how did he handle the temper, tam, temper, temper tantrums of some of the stars? Like, uh, I don't know, Frawley because on our, our show, we never had temper tantrums. I, like I, I said, to, well, I think... Talk more about Frawley, Frawley and Demarest then. Yeah, how, yeah how probably, did he end- you know, it was just part of his character. You weren't going to control that, you know, um, and you weren't going to yell at him because he would yell back and he would have yelled probably even if it was Fred DeCordo. It's just you hired him. That's who he was. And that's what you're getting. You're not getting somebody else. Uh, but our our show was relatively stripey, stripe free. There weren't uh, rivalries between the actors, you know, um, we had problems, you know, with the script sometime, you know, or at least it's Bill Frawley, some who writes this shit. This is what his most famous line. Um, and they'd have to get the writers down and fix it. Uh, you know, Fred McMurray would have the same problem, but he wouldn't say who writes this shit. They would just be quietly go up to the director or the producer and they would bring the writer down and work through the problem. And there was no histronics. I never saw Fred McMurray ever get mad or have a meltdown on the set. I can't say I haven't seen that, you know, in other things that I worked on where some star goes crazy or you know, just goes, shuts the whole production down while they're having their meltdown or a director kicking and throwing things. And we never had that, you know, it was really like a, a pretty happy family and everybody got along. And a lot of us socialized even off the, the set. We actually liked each other. Good. Yeah, no, you can definitely tell. That's I mean, rare. Just, That's rare. Yeah. So you Especially know, I since think you lasted even, twelve seasons too. I mean, it was a little, the second. This was the second longest running live action sitcom in TV history. So, man, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Did you? I know you said no in the beginning, but you, you, once your brother was on the show, was there any competition of who would get more screen time, who would get more dialogue? You two seems like yeah, you just got along. We never, we never had that because you know, even prior to that, we weren't really rivals for parts, and even afterwards, we looked markedly different from each other so we weren't even up for the same kind of things and i was happy to have barry on my big sons because i had nobody there but adults yeah occasionally yeah. you know they'd have a kid that would be there for the day so you know, that'd be more fun for me to have somebody my own age or somebody my own age in the classroom and uh, yeah when barry finally got there you know we shared the classroom we shared a dressing room and you know we shared a ride to work we shared a bedroom at home so there was no good you know real i mean you know some brotherly stuff maybe occasionally you know popping yeah. in the nose or he'd slug me or whatever and we, we work our way through it and yeah but nothing ever serious just uh good. regular good. regular brother stuff definitely rare. now with uh don grady i know uh, from what i was reading sometime during the show they filmed the pilot but it never aired it was originally called three of a kind then they were going to call it robbie and for some reason, that never happened. What was the case with I don't that? Think, I don't think Don really wanted to do it. Uh, he was just really getting into his music. And I, I think he did it because Tina, you know, wanted to do it. And he just didn't want to say no. And I, I and then it turned out, I don't think the networks wanted it. It wasn't the finished product. And I think they were just trying to find a way. Because, you know, my three cents, we knew it was going to be over with because we got caught between what, what I would call a rock and a hard place. You know, the show was still high in the ratings, high enough that you wouldn't have canceled it, but the FCC had come down with a mandate. Uh, our show was sold to CBS back in the sixth year or fifth year. And the, the network actually owned the show, wasn't an independent producer anymore. And they came down with a ruling that the networks could no longer own shows and exhibit them. You know, it was an antitrust thing. So they were going to have to get euthanize all the shows that they own or sell them back to a producer to produce and then license it back from that well what producer is going to pay for or buy a a 12 year old show you know it's like buying a, a tire that's got you know 100,000 miles on it you're not going to get a lot of mileage out of it so that yeah, was uh, the decision was made you know to not 
continue and CBS decided they were allowed to keep one show and the show they kept was Gunsmoke. So <laughs> after the 12th year, it just kind of went away, which is good. You know, it's not like it died a hideous death in the ratings or that Fred McMurray quit or, you know, the actors didn't want to do it anymore. I, I even thought about leaving the 12th year because my contract was up and I had an offer to do a Western. Uh, I think it was in Virginia. They wanted to write a character in there for me. And I thought, this would be cool. I got in the business to be a Western. And finally, somebody wants to make a Western. And I'm going to be able to ride a horse and shoot again. But I couldn't leave. You know, I said, wow, you know, this is 10 years, 12 years, 11 years. And I, it would, I felt like a rat jumping off a, a ship, you know, and I couldn't do it. So I stayed to the end. I can't remember if it was either the 10th or 11th season. Robbie mysteriously goes to Peru and never comes back. Is that was was that because of the music? Well, yeah, because Don and myself, we both had contracts that ended the eleventh year. <laughs> so it's sort of like I came back and he didn't, you know, he didn't want to do it anymore. And I, I was on the fence about that. And I, I'd had this offer, and I thought, well, if I do this other thing, I'll be seen another way, which is, you know, handles a lot of problems for actors. It's, you know, all of a sudden I could wear my hair long, probably have a little, you know, some step, stubby beard and be a cowboy and be something that wasn't chip. Yeah. And from that standpoint, but then, you know, to, to leave with McMurray and the rest of the cast who were gainfully employed, it just, I, I went with the show. I just figured when it ends, I'll, I'll figure that all out. Did they ever approach you like they did with uh, Don Grady and say, we'd love to do a spinoff with you and Polly because you had the whole subplot with the father who was mad because you eloped with her. I mean, it was, they, they could have easily made it another TV series. I mean, had, yeah. Had... I, you know, I don't, I don't know if that was ever a thought for me. I, I know it was for Don and, you know, Don was probably more of a you know a powerhouse on the show than I was I mean his character I mean my character was well liked but I think that whole Tina Don thing and the triplets was infatuating to the audience so you know just me looking at it as a producer I would have I would have chosen that over Chip and Polly yeah uh, you know the one who should have gone on is Dodie <laughs> she could have kicked some ass <laughs> I agree I, I would watch that show I would watch the Dodie, the Dodie show, show. Right, she would be like I was in Skippy, you know, like teaching adults a lesson, <laughs> you know, but either it, verbally or kicking them in the shins, one of the two. Well, you know what's impressive? I mentioned that uh, My Three Sons, the second longest running live action. You know what number one is? Ozzy and Harriet. Oh, Ozzy and Harriet, yeah. Yep. Okay, they went so you were number years. one and number two. All right, yeah. And I was glad I was in, you know, whatever. 10, 15 of their 435 episodes. You can believe that. That is very impressive. In fact, I, I just, uh, at the Hammer Museum, went and gave a, a little talk and was in a panel uh, for Ozzy and Harriet. They just had their 60th, 60th uh, anniversary of the show. So Barry right. and I went, and then uh, they had Tracy Nelson and Sam Nelson were the other part of the panel. And they, showed you know some episodes and some really cool stuff with rick playing various songs he had on the show and a good q and a at the end with the audience who were you know truly interested in ozzy and harriet i i thought that was one of the best shows ever i i think people should revisit that that is just and when you think about what ozzy did you know we had fred mcmurray but you know he was an actor showed up knew his lines and was a big movie star but ozzy wrote those episodes acted in those episodes, directed those episodes, produced those episodes, and edited those episodes. And got the idea to, you know, to take music and kind of make the first music videos that were like embedded in a show. You know, he took Rick and said, well, you know, come up with a song. And I think they did I'm Walking and they put it in the show and it was really well received. People wanted to see uh see Rick do more and they did. So they kind of concocted the show where at the end of the show, they would leave a, whatever, two or three minutes for him to do a song and it would play. And then the next week you'd said, sell 10 million 45 <laughs> records, you know? So from a business standpoint, and I don't, a lot of people don't know this, Ozzy was an attorney. So he did all the business you know, matters too. Oh, no, I did not know that. So, yeah, I, yeah I, I didn't realize how much control he had on the show too. I just thought it was, you know, it was show, his. Uh, yeah. wow, Talk about his fun. baby. That that's why you know, from knowing how to 
do all this from the technical side and the creative side. I, I just have the ultimate respect for that guy. And it's just a, it's a, it's a great show. It's just, you know, soft humor, uh, gentle humor, but it just, and it evokes kind of a time and a place, you know, a little bit of out of kilter, what was really going on, but just so human and, you know, just had, you know, the human touch to it. So it, I think it will be eternally funny. You know, if you've got human beings in there and doing things that you can relate to because you've done them, you've conquered, you know, what people want to see, I think, on the screen. Yeah, no, I, I watch the show every day, go on YouTube or somewhere and find a clip or an episode and I still laugh at it. I, I love the show. I did uh, notice yeah. in w at least one episode, there might be more than I, because I didn't watch the entire series in years, but there was one episode where Don played and then um, Fred went and he found an, an artist that he liked growing up and he had Don well show her how it's you know how kids play music today so was that more to appease him like let me put some music in there and this is no, I don't that, that was just came from what we were doing in real life and you know Don was you know he'd been doing music since you know he was a kid even in the Mouseketeers and all that so they didn't incorporated that you know with him writing music and writing songs I know we had JP Morgan he wrote the song she sang and then in my three sons he had a group called the griefs who was a real group in real life too but they had some songs and then Don was also moonlighting he was in a group called the yellow balloon who had a song that was a kind of big hit called the yellow balloon but the the stories i think the you know the writers would come down the set and we would always talk and they go hey what are you doing i was into surfing or skateboarding or bikes or collecting stamps or collecting coins and there'd always be an episode you know shortly thereafter where i remember there was one with stamps i was collecting stamps for a while and there was another one where i was collecting coins and i accused ernie of spending my $10, 1909 SVDB penny, you know, to buy bubble gum. And, and then it turns out it just fell behind the bed or something. So, yeah, you know, they would mirror what we were doing. Uh, you know, we were into like camping. So they wrote a Boy Scout episode when we went camping. I think it was called One of Our Moose is Missing. I think Ernie and I, or Ernie wanders off and is lost in the woods. We have to go find him. Then I remember I was really into UFOs about 1966, 67. Suddenly we had a UFO episode and it took place like near an army base and somebody saw something land and, you know, it turned out it wasn't a UFO, obviously. Back who was in that was uh, Johnny Crawford's brother, uh, Bobby Crawford was in that episode. Uh, but yeah, well, the the other thing that My Three Sons was pretty well known for, and I'm pretty proud of that, was if if you go online, in fact, I, I'm going to have my my own website, I'm rebuilding that stanleylivingston.com website, and yeah, should have that up by the hopefully the end of the week. Yeah, but I you know hadn't refreshed it since I think 2010, so it's like 10 years old. But going through it for the new material and new photos, I was seeing a lot of stuff, and I stumbled across the guest list of actors on the show and. It was like amazing to me how many big stars were on our show. Uh, yeah. You know, actors that were at one time, you know, the top of the movie profession and, uh, you know, were now in their senior years, but wanted to work. And, you know, they wanted to be on My Three Sons. It was prestigious because you had Fred McMurray on the show. So, you know, it wasn't like being on the Pinky Lee show or something and just looking yeah. for a paycheck. And then there were people who were just starting their careers. It might've been their first or second job, but you know, there's people like uh, Bo Bridges, Martin Sheen, um, Sally Kellerman, Sal Mineo was in it, um, although he'd already had a career, but a lot of people that were, you know, new to the industry. One, one of my favorites is Steve. His character was an aeronautical engineer the whole time. And there, it was, I think, in the early 60s, there was a flat, he's in his office and he has a flashback to when he was young and was, you know, an aeronaut, young aeronautical engineer and was talking to his boss. Well, the actor that they hired to play Fred, the young Fred, it was Tom Skerritt. No way. That one I have not seen. Yeah, that's that crazy. That's funny. Well, I, the two that I did see very recently was one starring Zsa Zsa Gabor and Ernie yeah, Got Zsa Lost. Zsa and, Gabor. Yeah. And then the other one I saw recently was when you wanted to be a rock star and your friend was uh, Mickey Dolan from The Monkees. Yeah, and, Mickey was on it. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, the one where we were adopting Ernie and they had a welfare worker who was interviewing us and Fred and Fred, they kind of have a little flirtation. It was Vera Miles. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So there were, you know, all the time there were 
people like that on Lou Ayers, um, you know, from All Quiet on the Western Front. Um, well, like I said, Jimmy Stewart. Uh, it was just George Goble. I mean, you name it. We, we were sort of a hotbed of places where older actors would come and, you know, now, who was the other guy? Yeah. Oh, Ed Begley. And then because he was on, he got his son a job on there. And that Ed Begley Jr. went on to become a pretty big actor. Yep. Um, uh, he, that was his first job. Wow. Yeah, I, my three sons. Funny. Yeah, no, you. I, I still have uh, been watching a lot more recently. I still enjoy the show as much as I did back then. And I might be one of the only ones that thinks the show did not jump the shark. It actually got better in the later years. And I know the different cast members. And I do want to have you back for a second. I know you have to go. I just want yeah, to, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll definitely do that. I want to talk just about figure out your, notes, your voiceover we'll work. Well, I'm sorry, what was that? Uh, I said, yeah, just figure out your, you know, what you want to talk about. And we'll, we'll continue on. Yeah, I mean, you know, didn't really talk about how the West was won, which was probably yeah. the other thing that I'm known for besides my three sons that they uh, restored the film in 2012. And, you know, I thought it was sort of all over with it. You know, it came out in 1963, 64, whenever it came to the theaters and was a big deal Western in its day. But then they restored it in 2012, or no, 2010. And uh, yeah, I mean, I almost, wow, since 2012, uh, probably at least five times I've had to go to the Arc Light Cinema and introduce the film to the audience. I mean, it kind of fell to me. I'm sure they'd probably rather have you know, Jimmy Stewart or Henry Fonda do it. Or, and for a while, it was Debbie Reynolds. And I remember one of the times I was there, I introduced it with Debbie Reynolds. And one of the stunt guy, Lauren Janes, was there. So the three of us talked about you know working on it and, and it introduced it to the audience beforehand. But even as late as, I think, about a year ago, they, had, they played it at the Cinerama Dome. Maybe it was two years ago. And... Um, yeah, I went there and yeah, talked about working with the different actors and especially Henry Hathaway. And um, yeah, so it seems to be the other thing that I'm known for that somewhat well, appreciated. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about Devlin, Scooby-Doo, um, Aftermath, a movie you wrote. I want to talk about private parts. I want to talk about Attack of the 50-Foot Centerfold. There's so many things that I didn't even get right. that I had written down. So there's there's probably another three hour interview in the works with me and you. I, I really did enjoy having you on the show. Thank you very much for coming on here and uh, yeah. talking about everything and anything. So I appreciate that. You got it, man. All right. Well, we'll do that soon. All right, I look forward to it. Stanley, it was great having you on the show. And that wraps up another episode of the Claws Corner. A huge thanks goes out to actor, director, producer, writer, editor, voice actor, and crash test dummy himself, Mr. Stanley Livingston, for taking time out of his busy schedule to be on the show. And of course, this show would not be possible without the hard work and dedication of my editor, John Bristol of Elmwood Productions. Thank you for always doing a superb job. Lastly, and definitely not least, I need to thank you, the viewer, for always tuning in. Enjoy your day, everyone. Diaphragm again? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ha! We caught one. They're supposed to be weird. Oh yeah, no. If you say so. I've always wanted to be in a movie. Waiting around for autumn. Waiting around for autumn. I was